Bible says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And the choir already sang my favorite song, so, you know, I was about ready to do the ugly cry. But that's just my song. It just tears me up. But a song that's on my heart, and um, Sister Jacinda sings it. And if I could just do just a couple bars, if she'll help me, it's, um, I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away I give myself away So you can use me I give myself away So much you may be seated I know you're probably tired and I am aware of the time and I'm not a long-winded person I'm quick and to the point we're just gonna let the Holy Ghost have the right away is that okay? okay and thank you sister Bennett for that lovely introduction I first give honor to God who is the head of my life and I truly do love the Lord and I just thank him for everything that he has done for me. Patrick, don't laugh at me because you know I'm a cry baby. I know you laughing. So, but that's okay. But I am saved, I'm sanctified, and I'm baptized, and I'm filled with the precious Holy Ghost, and that with the ever burning fire that burns up everything that's not like him. And I'm still a work in progress. <laughs> okay? I give honor to 
my pastor, superintendent, et cetera, et cetera, and co-pastor Hart and assistant pastor Williams and his beloved wife and all of my brothers and sisters in Christ, evangelists, deacons, elders, porters, friends, enemies, in-laws, outlaws, ex-laws. I just thank God for all of you. He said, in everything, give thanks. And I thank God because it all helps to make me of who I am today. Amen? I thank God for a portion of my family, my sister who's closest to me, Esther. You see her by my side. I thank her. Uh, my nephew, I call him R.L. I've been inviting them and inviting them, so I finally had to kind of have a little edge on them. So they came to support me and also two of my neighbors. If you all would just stand very briefly, just very quickly. And my neighbors are truly good neighbors, and I really do love them and my family, and I thank you for your support. Um, I'm going to attempt to share a thought with you, something that God has been dealing with me on, and I was attacked with a headache, and then the pain went to my foot, and I'm going, okay, you know, and it's a, a fairly unpopular um, topic, and it's dealing with confrontation. Can we say confrontation? How many like confrontation? Okay, nobody likes confrontation. All right. It's a very difficult thing, but we're going to deal with it today. And um, I've always been the special child. I stayed in trouble because I was always confronting. And I didn't know, you know, that you don't confront everything. I just wanted to get understanding, you know. And I was the seventh child, you know, and Daddy was kind of had a rough hand. And so with ten kids, he didn't have time to explain everything, you know. So what he said, you better do or you're going to probably more than likely be on the floor, right? So we're familiar with that slight dysfunction in our family. You all, you know, some of you got the broomstick, some of you got the ironing cord. You know, old school, we ain't talking about the new, you're the youngsters, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But those of you who came up, you know, old school, you know, where you all sit on the same row, you know, and mama didn't have to say nothing, she'd just give you that look, and you might cry at the look, because you know what the look meant, what was to follow when you got home. So you feel me? So, you know, the other brothers and sisters, you know, they were kind of smarter than me, and it took me a little longer to catch on. So, you know, Daddy said, you understand what I'm saying? You know, so they said, yeah. So he come and ask me, do you understand? And I said, well, no. You know, he, you know, he look at me like, okay, this is the special child, you know. And, uh, but I did have enough sense to wait until he had calmed down. You know, when he got through all of his hooping and hollering, then, you know, I just kind of sneak and, Say, well, you know, Daddy, that just don't sound right, you know. And mother, brothers, and sisters say, you told him that. You know, now that we're older, I would tell them some of the conversations. But I believe God put something in me, but I just had to learn to develop it because it did give me a, a, a lot of trouble, Pastor, right? Because I've had a discussion with people regarding, you know, confrontation. I said, well, how come folks don't want to confront? You know, that should be easy, right? Just deal with it. You know, that's the way I thought. But with time... And with wisdom, God has taught me a few things, and I'd just like to share with you what I have learned to help keep you out of trouble, but yet deal with situations. Amen? Amen. So first of all, uh, there was a speaker that once said that you can't conquer what you don't confront. And you can't confront what you don't identify. You can't go around just getting up in folks' face and just saying something you don't know what you're talking about. You need to have some idea of what's going on, right? So identify means to recognize or establish as being a particular person or thing, to verify, you know. When I was little, I didn't have to fight that much because I had seven brothers and sisters, you know. So anybody mess with me, you know, I just tell Esther or Joe or whoever, you know, they did it. And I could identify them. I had to establish that this is the person that was creating a problem for me, okay? Just to make it clear how we identify. With you, you need to identify, to ascertain, or to prove the same, that there is a problem, and take a look at it before you can do it. Confront, to stand face to face in full view. No wonder it's not an easy thing, huh? Because some people can't even stand to look in the mirror face to face at themselves just for the physical. 
So you can imagine when you want to look beyond what you see in that mirror. Amen? So confrontation, first of all, to be wise, would you say it would be wise to first deal with yourself? Right? Because really, usually when you take a look at yourself, you're not going to be too quick <laughs> to confront that other person because you're so busy dealing with me. Amen? And so that's what will kind of slow your role. To stand in direct opposition, to oppose. Well, I didn't know conf confrontation was just meant opposition, but it must mean that because when gangs come together <laughs> and they confront each other, they are not friendly, are they? They come in face to face, and the way they deal with it ain't too nice, okay? How am I doing, Chuck? Am I okay? Okay. I'm not long-winded, so he has another engagement, but he just stopped by to, <laughs> to just uh, support me, and I appreciate it. So how do I confront? James 3 and 17 says, but the wisdom that, it fr that is from above is first pure, then Peaceable, key word, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You know, you just got to come with it and just be real. You can't be beating around the bush, you know. And, you know, for a long time, a part of our family dysfunction was not confronting situations. We would just, because you weren't allowed, your opinion was not important. You know, it didn't matter. Only thing that mattered is that you had food <laughs> to eat, clothes on your back, and a bed to sleep in, and you went to church. Amen? That's just the way it was. But we learn, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality. You see something going on. You just can't continue to look at it. And a lot of times, we're hoping it'll go away so that we don't have to deal with it because really, it would be a lot easier, right? You know, say, first you see it, now you don't. Well, that's the way, some, you know, that's one of the ways, you know, people try to avoid it. So we confront the situation. First thing is to accept responsibility and stop blaming others. Most of the time, we're pointing our finger. They made me do it. My daddy did this when I was little. He wouldn't let me do this. My mama wouldn't. My mama, church kids, we couldn't do nothing but go to church, so that's why I'm doing it now. I know that's what I did. You know, when I got to college, it was like, okay, now I'm going to do everything that I couldn't do, you know. And I would blame it on my parents not allowing me to, you know, do, uh, I thought, be exposed to the streets, which really saved my life. And then when you uh, accept responsibility and decide to not blame others, a lot of times a situation when you look at yourself, it's painful. I know it, uh, I experience, I have experienced pain in dealing with myself. And um, as many of you have, I know you've probably uh, been through situations and you said, God, why me? Why am I going through this or whatever? And please show me me. You know, you get before God and you really think you really want to do some soul search until he starts really showing you. It's not always a lovely picture. Um, one morning, I guess it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm walking in my backyard, three praying, pastor, and I was just, I think I was trying to have a pity party and confront God in a halfway side matter, you know, but God made me, you know, we can't fool God, but, you know, I was coming straight with him, so God came straight with me. And at that time, I couldn't sleep because so much was on my mind. When God finished telling me about Estella Faye, I got in that house so fast and was so glad to repent and say, thank you, Jesus. I slept so good when he got through dealing with me. So, you know, you just have to really be real, be real without hypocrisy. And a lot of times we've been hurt by different people, you know, from different, it's just a way of life. When you're dealing with people, somebody is going to hurt you. And more than likely, it's going to be somebody that you really care about. Because if you don't care about them, they really can't. Can't touch you, right? So that's the way it is. So um, I was looking in Genesis 3 and 8 where I saw the first confrontation with man, and that was God approaching Adam and Eve in the garden. And we know the story. God put them in the garden, told them everything was free range, just don't, the tree of knowledge, that's the only thing that's off limits. The rest is yours. Okay. 
Satan comes along, talks to Eve a little bit, and she kind of starts listening, just started listening, which is your first thing when you just begin to listen and Satan starts talking to you, you're already on the wrong track. The minute you hear him talking to you, you just have to, just have to shut him down. But he started saying some things that sounded kind of nice and she kind of wanted to hear it, so she figured, okay, well, I won't die. You know, I'm going to be as smart as God. I'm going to be as God. She didn't realize it was with the lowercase G-O-D because you'll never be equal to God. But she allowed herself to be deceived. And because God gave man the choice, he let them go ahead and make that choice to sin. And what I like about in th uh, Genesis 3 and 8, it said, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In the cool of the day. Now, you know, I like to kind of imagine what was really going on. So, you know, at first, before they ate of the, tr of the tree, the fruit, whatever it was, they were not aware they were naked. But all of a sudden, they ate that tree of knowledge, and all of a sudden, you know, wow. You know, they had to cover themselves up. So can I just tried, to, okay, I wonder what was the point of discovery? You know, what was Adam saying and what was Eve saying, Pastor, that they had to cover up? Because they started discovering some things that they hadn't paid any attention to. And then I saw that it said, because I said, walk in the cool of the day. So evidently, it wasn't too cool before that. God let things kind of cool down and let them do whatever it was they, whatever they did, things that calmed down. He didn't do it while in the heat of passion or in the heat of confusion. You know, he didn't try to confront it. You know what I'm saying? But he allowed them to go ahead and deal with their own guilt. So they were really miserable and shaken and scared. And I often think, what if, just what if Adam had decided, okay, Eve, we're going to go to God and repent. Just hurry up and just go repent or something, you know? You ever think about stuff like that? Because they were human, right? They think like us. We still got the mind, feelings, and stuff. But no, when God came through, among them, and he called Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou? I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. He didn't ask you what you did. He just said, Where are you? But he was feeling so guilty, he started all of, all of a sudden already making excuses, not accepting responsibility. So God just um, said in, he, in verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So God actually identified and confronted them right then and there. You didn't know you were naked yesterday, and now all of a sudden you're naked and you hide, and you can't even tell me where you are. What's up with that? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be, he didn't even say her name, he didn't say Eve, he said that woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave it, she, did, she made me, she talked me into it, and so I just did it. Okay, so that's the first blame, right? Not a good thing. So God said, okay, now Eve, so what happened to you? What's your story? Well, the serpent, so they passing it down. Nobody's accepting responsibility, you know, but God was just cool about it. He said, okay. He said, I didn't hear that, but anyway, and the Lord said to the woman, what is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord said to the serpent, he already knew who he was, so he didn't have to ask him nothing because he was nothing but a liar and full of sin anyway, so it didn't even matter. He said, but because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. You're going to eat dirt. You're going to crawl on the ground. And you and woe man and anything other man that she brings into the world, there is always going to be strife between you. Okay? And so God nipped it in the bud. He confronted it. He identified the situation. Y'all done sinned. Y'all done kind of lied, you know. Didn't accept responsibility, this is that, and, and so on, you know. God forgave them, of course, but that was the reason we are where we, you know, are here today, and we have to continue to seek God, to know that uh, whatever it is, that the peace of God 
can bring us through any situation. And we have to rely totally on him. If you don't hear anything else, to know that rely totally on God. It is better to put your trust in God than your confidence in man. Because man is just that. Just flesh, subject to error at any time. Not intentional, but it can happen. So we have to know that there is a God who is faultless, who is omnipotent, and he can just handle any situation. And we can trust him and count on him. He never sleeps or slumbers. And it's never too late, it's never too early to call on him when you need him. Amen? Amen. So we see that... Um, the problem was identified, it was recognized, and dealt with. And that was the first example um, that I just wanted to share. Um, also, when um, Jehoshaphat was confronted with the enemy, and he, and he knew that um, they were outnumbered, and that way outnumbered, and didn't know how to uh, confront the enemy. So what did he do? He sought God in Second Chronicles 2017, after he... He actually, um, let's see, go up a little bit to um, verses 2 uh, Chronicles 21 through 4. It says, And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee, from beyond the sea, on this side, Syria, and behold, there be in, ooh, Hazan Tamar, something like that, which is Egendi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. That was the wisest thing that he could do. He didn't just jump in and say, okay, we're going to, you know, go into battle. He had enough sense to not only seek the Lord, but he had all of Judah to go on a fast and to seek God for what they should do. And what God told him in verse 20 and 17, they didn't even have to fight. He said, ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Now, there is a time that you do have to fight. Sometimes there isn't. just depends on whatever God says. We have to learn how to abase, how to abound. Amen? But we just seek God and acknowledge him in all of our ways. And he is faithful to direct our path. And he said, ye shall have no need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Is, isn't that just wonderful that God can just tell you, you don't even have to, you don't even have to touch this one. The battle's not even yours. Just sit back and watch me work. Just let me handle it. Amen. It says, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And all they had to do was just go out and praise God and just watch him deliver them, and he did deliver them from that. Um, also, uh, when you're uh, in a situation, a lot of times um, we're worried about the person who has what can you say, who maybe who has hurt you or, wrong, or wronged you, you know, and you may want to confront a situation and got to say, no, leave it alone, I'll handle it. Because there's no better pay than when God pays. Because when he does it, it ain't nothing nobody can do. No man, nobody on earth can't say a word, they can't blame you, can't say you should have did that. Isaiah um, 59 and 18 says, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands, he will repay recompense. Amen? Amen. And sometimes it's not in the time that we think, but if we just hold on, as pastor was preaching this morning, I was just so energized and just so encouraged, you know. And we have, sometimes we need to uh, be encouraged um, by others, and then there's sometimes you have to encourage yourself. You don't always have the pastor to preach a sermon like he did this morning. So I would admonish you to feast off of it and enjoy it because that's not going to always, you know, be the case. Uh, in uh, David's case, in Isaiah 30 and 5, when David's uh, wives were taken captive, it was a very uh, distraught situation, dismal. And at one point, David, uh, when he was doing good, oh, 
Everybody was praising David and saying that when he killed Goliath and oh, he was the man and everybody was patting him on the back and you know, proud to have him as their leader and saying nothing but good things. But then when the chips were down, it was a whole different story. And I thought of Pastor one day, he was saying that sometimes uh, he can't talk to anybody but God, how he would go to the park. And I thought of this when David, uh, in Isaiah 30 and 6, it said, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. They wanted to kill him. He had saved them out of many situations and brought them back from battle. So this is what I'm saying, why you can't depend on people, because you never know. Sometimes the very time when you think that they're going to be there, People are just, they're just that. They're just people. So you have to depend on God, and then you have to be strong enough sometimes to encourage yourself. To encourage yourself. It says, um, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for their daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And also, David inquired of the Lord. Now, David was a bad boy. You know, he could take on many, thousands and thousands, but he had enough sense. He was distressed, and he knew there was an emotional thing, because, see, these were his wives and his family. You know, it's different when you're battling with family. You know, that's your, that's your blood. That's a part of you. So you can sometimes be just kind of thrown with your emotions. So you got to really be prayed up and seek God. And in 1 Samuel 38, 30, uh, and eight, it says, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, shall I pursue after this God? Should I just go get him? You know, shall I overtake them? And God's answer was just what he wanted. And he answered him, pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, without fail, you shall what? Recover all. And I'm just here to tell you, that I believe whatever the situation is, without fail, we shall recover all if we just put our trust and our confidence in God and seek his face as David did in so many, in so many situations. And rather, whatever you do, stop the excuses. Stop, the, all it does is hinders you. Oh, you know, I'm just hurting too bad. I'm just so sad today. I just don't feel like doing anything. And there's so much that God has, such a calling on your lives. Or you wouldn't be here tonight. I don't believe you would be here, you know. So don't, whatever it is, don't let the pain keep you from pursuing whatever purpose it is that uh, God has called you for. And I was looking in John, and this is the last example that I'm going to use, and that was with excuses, the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And I would just like for you to put yourself in this place, and hopefully you can't, but just to imagine this man had been laying there for 38 years. Can you imagine making excuses every year? And Jesus just walked up to him. All he asked him was, would thou be made whole? And the man started saying, well, you know, I was about to. And just as I was about to, somebody got in my way. So you about to 38 times? Something's wrong with that picture. Something's wrong with that picture. And it sounds incredible, but we have that today. We have some who have been in the church 38 years, about to, about to accept their calling, about to go and do what God told them to, about to go lay hands on the sick so they can recover, about to go get a job, about to go get an education. And all I'm saying, the only about to that I would like to admonish you to do today is stand up, cut out the excuses, just come before God. Just come before him and say, God, I just surrender all. I give myself away so that you can use me for your glory. Not mine, because on my own, I am nothing. I know that I am nothing. You are nothing. But God is all about you so that you can be glorified. There is a work to do. The awesome message this morning was just, I just, I don't know. And, and they said that you had the nerves to preach better at 1130 than you did at 8 o'clock. And I just couldn't imagine it because I was really tired. But I don't get that excited you know, because I'm praying for the pastor, but I just got lost in the message because I found myself, so I was just really, you know, I was just into it. You know, I was feeling it and receiving it. And I, when I say I give myself away 
so God can use me. Can you just imagine if we all just really took that seriously and just come before how powerful, you know, just if one can chase a thousand, my God, how many are in this room today? City of Long Beach will never be the same. It will never be the same. I was about to get saved, but I couldn't leave Boo Boo, you know, or I couldn't leave Keisha, you know, some all these names. We just have, it's going to always be a reason. I, I was about to go, I was about to surrender and rededicate my life, but I left a situation at home. I was about to come and tell the pastor to pray for me so I could rededicate my life, but I left a blunt in my car. Worried about the blunt in your car or the beer in your refrigerator. It don't matter what you left. What if you would just seek God? And just come before him right now while the water is troubled. Don't get up there and say, about two for no 38 years. Don't wait no 38 hours. Now is the time and the acceptable time for you to receive salvation and to just commit yourself and do what God has called you to do. And as you're standing, and as the altar workers, if you will come, if there's anybody, and there is, we're standing. I told you I wasn't going to take long. It don't take long to tell you what God has given me. We just want to have, have the opportunity for you to come, to come, and stop being about to. If you would dare to be that man or woman or boy or girl, to boldly confront, say, yeah, I'm going to confront this. And just give it to God with God helping me. I'm going to confirm. I'm going to take a look at myself. 